Hi, I'm Tim Zacharias with Cougar USA and your host of Building Value. Uh, today, my guest is CEO of SPD Construction and longtime friend, Rob Walters. Welcome to the show, sir. Thanks for having me. I'm really glad to be here. Awesome. Awesome. Well, we have a great episode for you today. We're going to be talking about the importance of relationships with clients and vendors, as well as how supply chain issues are changing procurement on construction projects and the outlook for the construction industry moving forward. On Building Value, we go behind the scenes of building operations to showcase the people and products that make buildings work and the value they bring to the community. So I, I think I know uh, the, the, you know, kind of your background story, but if you, if you would, can you tell us where you grew up? Born and raised um, Houston, Texas, um, then, you know, via Sugarland, mm-hmm. went to high school out there, um, raised um, in the commercial construction industry, I would say, so to speak. Uh, my father's a commercial architect. He's also an Aggie. I'm an Aggie. I know you're there you an go. Aggie. Yeah. My wife's an Aggie. Um, I uh, I like to say she uh, she brings the brains in the family um, <laughs> with her business degree from A and M. So, um, but no, uh, we're uh, local to Houston. Awesome. So after A and M, what did you what did you do out of college? So getting out of college, um, you know, kind of getting into the workforce, I. Uh, <clears throat> It was one of those, you know, I would say life moments where you have, um, you know, your father gives you this distinct direction that you didn't realize at the time he was giving you, but, but it ends up being pretty good advice. It was, uh, you know, Hey, go make a name for yourself. Um, you know, I could, I could make an introduction for you, but I'm not. And so (laughs) some tough love. So, yeah. So go figure it out. So, you know, um, put, put the resume out there and and went to work for a uh, apartment builder. Uh, but it was more disaster restoration, kind of stick and brick, uh, fire jobs, hurricanes, that kind of stuff. Did that for a short period of time. Um, realized that, you know, maybe I was worth a little bit more. So went and kind of put it, put my resume out there again and went to the supply side, uh, of the construction industry. Um, granite, car- with that. yeah, great. There you go. <laughs> Gra- granite carpet, tile and wood. Um, and then, okay. you know, circled right into what I would say is my, you know, been my career since, which is commercial general contracting. Sure. Um, which has been almost 15 years. Yep. Um, so truly commercial contracting prior to that, I had some good, uh, foundational summer jobs, things like that. When I was really young through high school and college, um, you know, with some custom home builders and things like that. So kind of always been around it. Um, just from the the standpoint of my father being a commercial architect, I knew I didn't have the, uh, the the detail approach for the AutoCAD and and the, and the patience to sit behind a computer. Sure. Sure. Um, really like, you know, being out in the field and, and being able to, you know, go and solve problems and absolutely and be in and out of the office. So that's, yeah. that's it. Yeah. The problem solving is definitely a fun part of the job. For sure. For and there's, sure. There's plenty of problems to solve on most construction projects. That's right. <laughs> no doubt. So how, how did you and your partner start SPD? So, you know, um, we were both, you know, working in the commercial construction industry um, and, you know, both had, you know, decade plus experience doing what we were doing um, and and large to, I would say, really large uh, on his side, commercial construction projects. Mm -hmm. Um, And we just decided, you know, we had both gotten to a point in our career where it seemed like the right, the right timing for both of us kind of for different reasons, but, you know, and got introduced, um, you know, through some, some mutual connections in the industry, um, at some industry events and we're going to the same church at the same time. And so we just started a conversation and we thought, man, we've got, he's got a good bit of resources. I've got a good bit of resources. Let's, uh, you know, let's put this together and and see how far it'll go. And, you know, just trying to take it slow. I mean, I, I, um, I still say to this day when I'm sitting around and people are asking me, you know, hey, y'all are growing really fast. It's like, well, you know, I I don't think we're growing that fast. I think it's always just the growth kind of takes care of itself if you do the right projects for the right clients. And ultimately, you just do what you say you're going to do. If you if you tell somebody you're going to do something, you do it and they'll they'll come back. You know, absolutely. I mean, it does sound simple, but, you know, either fortunately for 
for you and, and we kind of operate the same way and potentially i guess unfortunately for others that doesn't always happen right right like you would you would think that that would be kind of like the baseline uh for for a lot of things in the industry but it is uh one of the things that we hear too is that you know hey you, you guys answer the phone you know you're out there to help us out and and i think it, it sets you apart Right, right. I mean, it's, you know, there's uh, there's a lot of people in a large city like Houston that do what we do, and there's just a select hand, you know, on one hand, things that I think are very important that if you can do that a little bit better or a little bit quicker or, sure. you know, then, then your competition, then, you know, people uh, people appreciate that from, from your vendors to your clients and, you know, kind of everybody in between. Absolutely. You know, it's definitely about building trust. I mean, I think that's that's one of the big things in, in the construction industry is, is having partners that you trust either as vendors or, you know, with uh, kind of as on the customer side as well. So I definitely, definitely agree with that. So where do you feel like SPD fits in as a general contractor kind of in the, in the big picture, like what's y'all's specialty? So, you know, we, we do all, all, all kinds of commercial construction. Um, we, we have a heavy, uh, hand in the retail automotive, uh, industry here in Houston and in Texas. Um, we do, we do a lot of that. Uh, we also do a lot of industrial, uh, light industrial, um, ground up office. We do some corporate interiors as well. Um, but you know, obviously I, I think a lot of people know us, um, as the guys that build a lot of car dealerships. Mm-hmm. Um, but we're, you know, we are, you know, on a growth track, and I would say, ultimately, our goal, we want that to be a fraction of our business. Um, if we can continue to take what we've done and the, you know, the automotive clients that we have that we are on our third and fourth rounds of, of projects with and, and take that to the, you know, the, the brokers and the other guys that we're maybe on our first, you know, project with, I think it's just going to kind of naturally continue, sure. continue to evolve. So it's, uh, it's, it's been fun uh, seeing it, you know, it's just, we've, we've had Good steady growth, and all we're coming up on our on our fifth year. Uh, this summer will be our five year anniversary. So just to see, you know, going through what we went through with the pandemic and all that stuff, and to have had the growth that we've had, we feel very fortunate. Yep. Um, but you know, it's a testament to our people, uh, the people that have come on, and our team members and our vendors, and you know, everybody, you know, kind of in between. That's awesome, man! Congratulations. I that's, appreciate it. That's a big, big milestone uh, for a company to get there. And I remember, uh, like, celebrating our our five year anniversary. At, you know, it uh, it was a it was a, a special time. And I think that's kind of one of those moments where, like, okay, I think I think we take got a breath. This. <laughs> I, think we, I think we got this right. 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 So right. so that's awesome. I mean, it uh, it's definitely an, an adventure starting a business, and uh, so applaud you for that. And and uh, you know, it sounds like y'all have what uh looks like a winning formula to to grow and uh so that's awesome so sure. what uh you know what would you say is kind of like your next next type of project that you're going after or next kind of niche in the industry so you know i think um our ability to go vertical okay so um i i, I built some vertical uh structures you know in in my in my past history and my partner's done quite a few of them Mm -hmm. um and you know there's even in the automotive world there were some bigger dealerships and those were the ones that i I got exposed to and then on his side of things it was a lot of high-rise multifamily office that kind of stuff so we're uh you know we're starting to have the ability and and it really it, it kind of circles back to Texas and the, and the, the nature of what's going on in Texas with everybody moving to Texas, yep. uh, very pro business. Um, I love it <laughs> as I'm sure you do <laughs> and, and, a, and a lot of others as well, but with the amount of people that are coming to Texas, there's just massive population growth and, you know, everything from our automotive side of our business to, you know, the office and the, mm-hmm. mul- and the multifamily oh, stuff that's, exploding. is yeah. exploding. So, uh, we haven't done any multifamily yet. We've we've looked at a few strategic projects that uh, podium deck type projects that um, haven't got going, but we feel like that project, that right multifamily job, will come uh, soon. But yeah, we're doing you know quite a few uh, parking garages, and you know we we like to take you know kind of our experience on different sides of our business and apply it to the other ones. You know, a big thing is flood control, as you know. Absolutely. And, um, 
you know, with the new flood requirements and all that stuff that's going on, um, a lot of our clients that, you know, we've had to kind of solve this puzzle of, all right, you know, how do we get the, the maximum amount of parking on, a, on an automotive site yep. for the least amount of money. And then, you know, there's only so much land. And then there's inefficiencies with satellite lots and things like that. So we've got a pretty good formula. We've done a couple of, of pretty uh, significant projects that have been, you know, parking garages over detention ponds. Um, oh, wow. So, you know, those have been really fun. And uh, to see our guys and our team kind of tackle those from just, you know, basically a napkin sketch with mm-hmm. a client saying, okay, hey, I got this 20-acre campus. It's got three brands and I've got a 20 foot deep hole. How can I park over it? You know, <laughs> exactly, yeah. and so, you know, there's obviously other options out there with underground detention and things like that. Um, but, uh, really, you know, allowing them to add, we just added like 800 cars to one campus wow. here, um, that, um, you know, services three brands and, and they, they're, they're out of cars right now, but yeah. that will correct itself with the, you know, with the chip shortages <laughs> and kind of the, the COVID yes. challenges. So. Yeah. It's really interesting that you mentioned the the kind of stormwater issues with development on either, you know, a new lot or an existing lot. The the city of Houston has put out they, they did a study on some ways to try to incentivize some of the um, I'd say more creative ways to either capture or slow down the release of that water mm-hmm. into the the stormwater. So so you know it'd be interesting to see how owners take advantage of those incentives uh, and what, what kind of impact they have on the way that you're doing the detention. But uh, putting a parking garage over a detention pond is definitely a creative way of solving that problem. Right. And, and you know, even even one of these um, specifically, it'll have the ability to be built out into a service shop in the future. So, uh, that's cool. um, yeah. So, I mean, it's all about, you know, volume calculations and all that stuff and getting your structure out of the floodplain and all that good stuff. But, um, yeah, they, they'll be able to add over 50 service bays. To wow. The, to the first floor of this garage in the future um, as population continues to grow and their business continues to grow. And so um, just uh, kind of a cool, cool thing that can service all three brands on this sure. one specific campus. And I'm sure that's a very profitable part of the business for them. So I'm sure they're oh, yeah. happy to be able to add that. Well, they love service right now, service and selling cars before they hit the lot. <laughs> oh, yes, <So. laughs> yes, yes. Been through uh, that process recently and it is, uh, it's very very much a seller's market right now oh, yeah. for sure <laughs> for, for cars. Sure. so well that's awesome so you know you talked a little bit about the kind of the storm water and and going vertical and that's obviously a lot in in our wheelhouse and i know we've crossed over uh and worked with you on a couple of projects where the you know the dealerships are growing and have greater demands on their water systems and starting to add pressure boosting systems and other things for car washes and so it's it's a new market for us um to, to get into. Um, and, and it's been great to, to work on those projects with, with y'all and some of the designers, things like that. So I'm curious, you know, do you feel like it's a, like a kind of a certain set of vendors or subs that work in those niches, like with where you are and, you know, how have you kind of built up those relationships? Yeah, I, I would say that, um, just, you know, specific to the automotive, there are, you know, subs that, um, have historically done a lot of that work, mm-hmm. but, um, that's been one great thing about, you know, my partner and I coming together with, you know, two different lists right, sure. of people that we dealt with over our careers and the crossover that, um, we've been able to bring from, I would say the high rise commercial multifamily side. And, you know, a, a lot of our vendor support has come from that side sure. and, and it's given us kind of an, an, I would say another tool in our, in our belt, right. Absolutely. That, historically has allowed us to be more competitive um you know because at the end of the day we're all here to make money and you know it, we we really have done a good job and tried to take pride in spreading the work around mm-hmm. um is that hey look you know I, and, and I, I tell vendors and owners of subcontractors this all the time don't be afraid to email me mm-hmm. you know and my guys are you know busy running the big jobs for us um you know as far as our pm staff and they may right. not have time to, to give you that bid tab but you know let me give you the feedback i'll take time out of my day to do it because i know that's what makes the world go around yep. it's like i'm not going to bid somebody four or five times and not get anything and then you know continue to you know yep. put forth it's, it's all about resources so um you know i try to fill a lot of those gaps that you know just to keep 
you know, keep the guys focused on what they need to be focused on, but to give, you know, the vendors their feedback and stuff like that. Yeah. And I can tell you from the vendor side, that's invaluable, right? Yeah. Like, and, and it's, it's funny that you, that you said that, like, Hey, I wouldn't want to keep calling on a guy that I, if I bid four or five times and didn't get any work from right. I mean, Scott and I literally had that conversation this morning, <laughs> <laughs> my, my business partner. So, I mean, it, it's definitely, um, you know, obviously the vendors want to get all of the work, but but you know, probably unrealistic as much as we would like to think it's not. Um, right. <laughs> but but totally understand where you're coming from on your side. You you know you need to have multiple uh, vendors and subs to be able to service all the work that you have going on. So I, I can see how it would be a little uh, difficult to navigate that that situation. Sure. I mean, if you want to grow and you want to get into all these market sectors that you know we're continuing to to knock down doors and get these you know ground up retail ground up office corporate interiors you need all these guys yep. to grow you know you you don't want to be um the guy that you know like i said the, there's a very few select things you can do one of them is spreading the work around one of them is paying your bills <laughs> paying your bills faster than the next guy yep I, I feel like that's very very important um to do cash and, is king yeah that's right and if you can help these guys i mean at the end of the day um you know you, you want them to make money and you want them to be able to keep their people busy just like you're keeping your people busy. Sure. So money's got to flow. Absolutely. And then, <laughs> and hopefully, you know, in that type of environment, you end up with a better product for, for right. the owner, right? Right, right. And then that, that client gets a, gets a good product and a good service and then they, they, wanna, they want you to do the next one. Nice. So do you feel like those types of relationships – with the subs that you have is, is what's going to help with your growth into the new markets? I do. I really do. Um, I, you know, the guys um, that, you know, our, our senior PMs and our project managers, the guys that I'll just say they're the deal cutters right now. And, uh, you know, my partner and I, we try to just sit back and look at, okay, here's the big picture. And, you know, we have 15 jobs under construction right now. Well, we'll you know, XYZ electrician, man, he's got 10 of those jobs. Well, mm-hmm hold on, but, you know, let's, as we've got this new wave of work and then we make sure, you know, in our senior staff meetings that we have every week with our, with our top guys that we're, you know, letting them know, Hey, I know this guy's doing you a good job, but you know, we can't put all of our eggs in one basket and how close were these other electricians. And we'll, you know, sit there and and go through those bids from those jobs. Even if we miss the job, you know, and we didn't, we weren't awarded the job that, you know, Hey, let's give them feedback. Let's, um, you know, that they were close and, you know, it, it's only fair. I mean, this guy's this guy's got his fair share over here, you know. Yep. No, I I agree. I mean, and that's if you like you said, put all your eggs in one basket, that's gonna be difficult, right? To to scale. So completely understand that. So, you know, you talked about the, uh, I mean, stormwater as being one challenge, but I mean, I feel like day to day, there's all kinds of things that uh, kind of come up or it can be issues on a construction site, especially given the last couple of years. So what do you feel like have been some of the challenges that, that y'all have had and, and how do you overcome them? So, you know, I, I would say, you know, specifically related to, to COVID and, and what's going on. I mean, you know, it's obviously construction's an essential industry and, you know, it's good that it was, it was, you know, deemed that way through that, through right. that part. But yeah, it's, you can just take it all the way down the line um, from, you know, it's how we've had to relearn how to procure the job. Um, you know, you used to, you get awarded a job. All right. You, you, first thing you do is you, you buy your steel, right? That that was always a long lead item. And then, you know, you kind of just start from the ground up. Uh, let's get the utilities, the MEP, you know, the stuff that's got, you know, HVAC units, things mm-hmm. like that. They've got, you know, get those guys submittals going and, and started. But now we're, you know, we're talking about things like insulation. We're talking about roofing, um, you know, that it's, and it's, and, you know, then there's things, you've got COVID that hits and then that storm that hit New Orleans. I mean, over 50% of the adhesives that yep. go for the TPO roofs were in, you know, some of those you know plants, factories yep. and plants that, that were, that were, you know, crippled by a storm, um, and not to mention, you know, the people and, you know, all the stuff that it displaced, but then you're dealing with that also. So, yep. um, yeah, I would say, you know, big things have been, have been that have been insulation has been a really bad one. Um, it's interesting. Roofing has been real tough. Um, steel, I would say, you know, for 18 straight months went up <laughs> week over week. Yes. Um, used to have a little, you know, 
fine print disclaimer on our bids. Our bids are good for 30 days. No one ever paid attention to that. If somebody wanted to sit with you and talk about doing a job, you'd say, all right, well, 45 days later, we're good. Yep. You know, 60 days later, we'd still work it out. Yep. Seven days, it's like, you know, you had to take a hard stance that these guys, their their suppliers are hitting them. They can't absorb it. It's crazy. It, it is what it is. And, yeah. you know, it just... It, it, it was funny because several specific projects you you really learned the hard way where it used to be okay project gets bid out it's over budget what can we do well let's value engineer it let's look at this let's look at this let's let's try to save some money man that that's a four to six week process in four to six weeks you've lost all that money and yeah. some yeah. so it's just you know trying to have those yep. tough conversations and and really just learn as we go because nobody was an expert at it and nobody could in good faith sit there and look at one of their customers in the eye and say hey I can't save you any money by VE in this. You just have to sign me up. I mean, yeah. it just seems kind of cold yeah. that, you know, you, you want to be the guy that, you know, hey, I'm going to do everything I can to get you the, the best deal I can. Right. Just dealing with the logistics in the market. Um, I would say procuring the job to specifically answer your question and how we do it. And, you know, it's a lot more front end work for our guys. Sure. It's a lot, lot longer hours. You know, because we do, we pride ourselves in doing a really good job of writing detailed scope sheets, project specific scope okay. sheets for our vendors. Um, we feel like that that's part of the partnership that we're taking on with that vendor. It, it, you know, right as the job goes, is you know we're going to write you a scope sheet. We're going to either do a Zoom meeting, you know, recently, yep. or we're going to you're going to come into the office and we're going to sit down and we're going to go through this and say, all right here's really the top 10 project specific things that we feel like, you know, we, you, you say you have it, you've got it, you know, but it's like once you've had a, a conversation and shaken somebody's hand and made a deal, it, it makes it, you know, a little, a little more solid. Absolutely. Yeah. It's good to kind of get everything out there make sure everybody's on the same page, have that good handoff meeting, uh, between, between the vendors and, or in uh, the subs there. So I, I've seen it on our side too, on the procurement. Absolutely. I mean, and it, it took a lot longer, uh, kind of to feel it than we thought, you know, I think there was some initial scare of like, Oh man, this is going to, this is going to hurt supply chain when we right. got into COVID. Um, but there was enough, you know, it's a big, you know, big machine with all this manufacturing, right? It takes a long time for it to kind of slow down. So it's, it's definitely been more in the last six months that we've, uh, started to feel it. Uh, but yeah, we're, we're trying to be creative as well. And part of that is being earlier in the, in the cycle, uh, right. with those submittals and the releases and, you know, working with our manufacturers to get hold for approval orders so they know what's coming in the pipeline. Uh, so there's, it's definitely changed the way that we work through that whole submittal and release process as well. And I know it's been uh, an effort on our inside staff, but they've been really good about keeping up with, you know, we used to ask the question like, or we used to try to say like, hey, the lead time's going to be about, you know, four weeks, four to six weeks, whatever. It is. Well, now the question is, okay, what, what date do you need it on site? <laughs> okay. And, and then we'll work backwards with the manufacturer to make sure that we can hit that date. Right. 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 And, no. and it's a, it's changed the conversation, but I think ultimately it's, it's getting what, what needs to be there for the project. Right. Well, and, and from my side of things and what we're trying to think about is, you know, the whole, the whole project, right. For everybody that's involved and, and how can we make sure that, you know, the, the lenders and, you know, the people that are financing these jobs understand that this is the new way of the world and they've done a really good job. We've got, you know, a lot of good, even on a national scale of some of the big, you know, national programs with the automotive stuff that we're doing that are, mm -hmm. that are, you know, in, I would, I would say in-house funding, but it's a funding for, you know, a specific brand. Sure. They, they do their financing. Um, those guys have, have even been good, you know, good past the local level banks that we have relationships with that lend on some of these projects, but it's just like, Hey man, stored materials, you know, we're, we're procuring oh, yeah. them bonded warehouses, you know, making sure, you know, there was always a select things. Like I would say flooring was always one that would, you know, come from China or Italy or something that had a really long lead time. Sure. And we would say, Hey, let's get this metals approved and let's get it on a boat. Oh, you know, yeah. This is a big, big service shop. It's got tile and the whole thing. Yeah. So, uh, but now that's, you know, that's coming, you know, all across the board, light fixtures, uh, things like that, that you just, you want to get in line early. And if you can do that, you've got the best chance at the least amount of curveballs because sure. there's still going to be those curveballs. And, you know, every project that starts, there's, I feel like there's still some, to your point, like delayed logistical issues that our industry is just having to deal with. It's the new norm. 
It is. It is. And, you know, I think we're going to hopefully be able to get out of this in the next, you know, six, 12 months, whatever, right. whatever right. it takes us to get out of it. But, but I do think there are going to be some of these habits that we've picked up along the way that, that will keep and will improve scheduling even more mm-hmm. when, when we get out of it. So I think ultimately right. it's one of those things where, you know, we all went through, uh, it, it's that, that kind of that J curve of success, right? We all had to kind of go through the struggle, but we'll, right. we'll end up coming out I agree. Uh, better for it. Yep. So, you know, c- kind of on that note, you know, looking out into the future, what are you seeing, uh, in terms of new, new things coming in, in the construction industry? Whether, think, you know, yeah, I was going to say we, we touched on it a little bit. Um, you know, the multifamily is, is big. The The corporate relocation to Texas has yes. been, been, been very big. I'm, I'm, I'm very, you know, proud of, of how our local government government has handled uh, accepting these other businesses. Mm-hmm. I think it's great um, that they're getting to come here and it's, uh, you know, a, 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 a entrepreneurial friendly and business friendly environment, the entire state of Texas. Yep. Um so I, I see that continuing to go because, um, you know, I felt like up going into COVID and, and maybe a little bit prior to that, you know, I would say multifamily was pretty, pretty built here, you know, and then there was a lot if not of, overbuilt. Yeah, o- o- <laughs> right. right. Yeah. Pretty <laughs> overbuilt. And then now it's catching up and then there's another, you know, kind of another wave that's coming, which is great. Um, it's allowing a lot of the what I thought the same thing about the kind of industrial and distribution, you know, oh, to, to wow, ca- yeah. you know, there was so much square footage out there that had been yep. built and, uh, and now there's more because they're, fi- they're, they're filling them, you oh, know, it, and it's, we're seeing in that all around us. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so that, that's been great. So I, I see that, um, you know, central Texas is, is our second largest market, um, as far as jobs that we have going on over there. So we we have a, a, a an internal heavy focus kind of over there, and we're we're doing some stuff in all really the major markets in Texas and Oklahoma, and and got some stuff actually going to start uh, in New Mexico. Oh, okay. So interesting. Well, that's good to hear. Yeah, it's uh, you know it, it goes back to what I said. You know, we're, we've got clients that you know we we want to you know help them any way we can, and uh, anything you know they ask us to do, we're going to do. Um, and so it's just kind of going into those new markets with a with a toe in the pond, but mm-hmm. you know know with the with the ability to to provide them the same service that we provide them here in Houston so yeah. if we can do that we we worked for three straight years in Oklahoma City okay um, just on you know consecutive projects in a row up there and once you've done that you've you've really gone through three four bid processes up there with different subs and you know I, I feel like our subs up there you know are on the same level with our guys down here as far as our relationships go so That's you good. know it's good once you can get some history in a, in a place like that and you know one and it makes you want to go back yeah absolutely so I, i'm you know my uncle has a house in taos new mexico and we love love going out there so i'm glad to hear there's some uh, activity going on in new mexico i feel like last time we were in taos didn't didn't really feel like there was right. a, much of a boom going so it's good to hear uh some activity over there but how, how does that what kind of a challenge is it doing business in an, another state like New Mexico and Oklahoma? You know, that I, I would say it is it is a very much a challenge. Um, you know, a lot of it is, you know, we we take somebody as in, you know, the, the main, the, the CEO of the job site, the superintendent, right? Um, and, and we're going to send one of our guys out there. Okay. Um, so you obviously, I think a big part of it is wanting somebody that's got, you know, your interest sure. uh, when you go into to a new market. Um, but then, you know, somebody that, that the superintendent is probably the most important personality on the job site, right? They're out there and they've got all these different personalities, all these different people that are showing up to their job every day. They've all got personal problems and different things that yep. are going on. And, and to be the uh, the conductor, so to speak, uh, of that is, is a very important part. So, you know, in certain auxiliary markets, when we first get there, um, we'll, we'll, we like to hedge our bet. We'll send, if, if we can send, you know, a, a foreman over and, and, you know, they feel confident, that subcontractor feels confident that they've got, you know, local labor um, or they need to bring their own labor. But it's also, it's kind of taking that, going to that next layer of defense with our with our subs that we mm-hmm. trust and, you know, making sure that, they've, that, that they're going to take care of business. Um, you know, a lot of times, you can send guys, and a long time ago, I did some work in Louisiana, and you can send a crew from Houston, and 
you know, the, the way they work and how they want to get done and get home will ultimately, you know, could make up for the fact that, you know, you might, that, that vendor doesn't know you or that sub right. doesn't know you. And, you know, you may be paying, you think you're paying a premium to send them out of town, but really how fast they get the job done, you know, it saves you and it saves you in the <laughs> end. So sure. it, it's all, it's all kind of case by case, but we, you know, we like to really try to hedge, you know, hedge our bet a little bit there with some of our, some of our guys, if we can, if, 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 if it affords itself to do. Sure. And I imagine there's a little bit of a kind of a, you have to get accustomed a little bit to the local market. I mean, I feel like when we, we've done some work in central Texas and uh, looked at expanding over there, you know, to San Antonio and Austin, and even those two markets, very different, very different. Right. right? And so uh, trying to kind of acclimate your, yourself and your teams into those different, different markets, it's gotta be a challenge. That's right. That's right. You know, you see a lot of people that uh, from the GC level to the sub level um, you get over there and we've, you know, got four projects under construction, a couple in design over there right now between San Antonio and Austin. And, um, yeah, you know, asking a guy in Austin to bid a job in San Antonio, he's like, no, that's not really what I do. <laughs> yep. I'm like, okay. Yeah, well. that was surprising. <laughs> yeah, San Antonio definitely feels like a, a homegrown it is. Uh, city for sure. Very much so. But they got some really cool stuff going on over there. And, and there's a lot of uh, construction there and in Austin. So that's that's a great spot for growth for you. For sure, for sure. Yeah. So – you know, what else would you, you know, you kind of look back, you said, what, about 15 years, I guess we've been in the industry about, mm -hmm. about the same time, you know, getting borderline on that, that veteran status, yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, maybe like me, you got a little more gray in your beard now than you did at the beginning of COVID, I was uh, gonna say, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you kind of look back and what are those things that you feel like, um, you know, as you worked for others and now that you've that you're that you're working for yourself at SPD what do you feel like are some of those things that have made you successful uh that would be good for for people getting into the industry you know I, I always go back to uh work ethic you know it's at the end of the day you know people talk about uh, as the generations you know are coming up um the different challenges that kids have that you know even we didn't have with the phones and everything and you know we came in right at that uh, that pager stage right and we started there and then yep. <laughs> and then went to the nokias and all you know the the phones that <laughs> the phones that couldn't get you in trouble yeah. um but you know I, I would say with these kids it's it's you know outwork your boss um you know my dad told me if you treat a business like it's your own one day it could be yours if you want it to. Sure. And so, you know, I always kind of took that piece of advice as like, you know, what drove me getting out of, you know, obviously everybody wants to provide for their family and all that. stuff. So, but hey, if I can outwork that guy that I've got to answer to, maybe I'll be in his position. And then, you know, and then from there and, you know, just simple things like beating your boss to work. Um, yeah. You know, it goes That's stuff back. to do in construction. Yeah. <laughs> it go, you know, and it goes, you know, from all the assistant superintendents to assistant project managers and these guys that come out of school that we talk to and we've, we've developed, um, uh, our own little internship program oh, kind of cool. already where we, we try to run at least one, if not two interns a summer. Um, we've got, we're on our, I think our sec third full, full time hire out of that. Very so, cool. um, where guys had come and, and worked over the summer or, you know, done a, um, construction science, you know, a co-op deal where mm -hmm. they worked for a fall and then, you know, then came on. Um, but it's just, it really gives you a good opportunity to kind of test drive them. Oh, right? absolutely. And yeah. then, you know, and, and we've found a lot of success with that. Um, you know, and so that, that's my biggest thing is, you know, just try to outwork your boss. And, you know, if, if you do what you say you're going to do and you treat the company like it's your own, no matter what you're doing in life, whether it be construction or, you know, anything, yep. um, I, I feel like you're going to have success. Yeah. I, I, I think those are great words of advice and it, you know, it sounds a lot like extreme ownership if, if you've read that book. I have. Um, that's a good one. Uh, Jocko Willick and Willink and I forget the other, uh, two Navy SEALs, but basically along the same lines saying, right. you know, ultimately it, it, you have to take ownership. Right? right. So, uh, but yeah, I think that type of work ethic and, uh, accountability for yourself and what you do is, and is don't be afraid important. to add, ask a dumb question. You know, I, I, I did a lot of that <laughs> yeah. when I was, when I was young and, and we, you know, we tell our young guys like, don't come in every 30 seconds with a question, but you know, formulate, you know, 
what you've tried, you've tried to find the information yourself, you mm-hmm. know, you've, and then you've got a list of whatever. I mean, I, I try to encourage our guys to walk into my office, you know, and ask me, um, if, if they've got something that they need. I mean, that was kind of just, you know, part of, it allows you to be a sponge. It allows you to put yes. yourself in these situations when you're really young and you're in your career and you're learning and I'm still learning. I'm sure you are every day, Absolutely. you know, you learn something new about this business, but, um, you know, those, those young kids, I, I think they can really set themselves apart if they, you know, just do a few simple things. Absolutely. I think you definitely have to have a growth mindset to, to be in this industry. I mean, you can't, can't walk into any situation thinking that you know everything there's right. Cause there's, there's no way. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, awesome. Well, you know, what would you say, um, you know, just, just thinking if somebody was coming up and saying, Hey, what, what is it about SPD that makes you different? Um, you know, I would say that we give our customers a large general contractor service for a discounted price. Okay. I, I would say that we provide service like some of our largest competitors in town. Um, but the level of detail at which we manage our projects, um, which is a product of our people and our culture and, and the way that, you know, from the field to the office, um, that, that, that is probably what sets us apart. Yeah. You know, you, you've got a lot of guys that are smaller, um, general contractors and they act smaller. Um, I would say we're at the mid size mm-hmm. range, uh, in just a short amount of time going, growing into the larger, uh, general contractor arena, but, uh, we have 30 full-time employees. So, um, that still kind of makes us small compared yep. to some of the other guys that we do that are, you know, around our volume of business that we do. Yeah. And I, I think that's a, you know, a, a good kind of a niche to be where you're big enough to have some of those resources of the big guys or be able to provide the same kind of, uh, product at a, at a, maybe a better level of service, like you said, but, uh, not being so big that, that you lose sight of some of that, that, uh, you know, close interaction with the customer, or the, right. the culture, like the you said, yeah. personal touch. Yeah. And I, you know, I feel like Cougars in a, a very similar place in, in our market. So definitely, cool. definitely resonate with it. Well, awesome. I really appreciate you coming on the show. Enjoyed the conversation. Well, thanks for having me, man. Yeah. And, uh, you know, like I said, I think your, your approach with uh, building the trust with your customers and, and growing with, with the partnerships that you have is, is put you guys on a path for success. And I appreciate you sharing that with us. Awesome, man. Thank you so much. Absolutely. And also want to thank everyone for watching and listening today and look forward to seeing you on the next episode of building value.